Welcome to Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, and before we begin at Isaiah 53, if you'd like to find out about our free notes and outlines and other resources that can enhance your understanding of this study, just visit ttb.org or call 1-800-65-BIBLE. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you with humility and gratitude for the love that you showed us on the cross and then the grace that saves us today. As we study Isaiah's words, Lord, we're mindful of the work that you still want to do in our hearts, making us more like yourself. So we ask that you would fill us with your spirit and show us where we need to surrender to you, where we need to trust you, and then be open to your spirit's work in our lives. Thank you for welcoming us into your presence. We come in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's Dr. J. Vernon McGee's beautiful study of Isaiah 53 on Through the Bible. Now, here we have in this 53rd chapter, this very marvelous revelation of the suffering and death of Christ. Now, as we enter this chapter, Isaiah, 700 years before Christ was born, he lets us see something of the suffering of Christ that we'll not find anywhere else. Before going any further, probably we must pause a moment to answer the question that someone even now is doubtless asking. How do you know that Isaiah is referring to the death of Christ? Isaiah wrote, as you've indicated, 700 years before Christ was born. How can you be sure? Well, that's the question that the Ethiopian eunuch raised when Philip hitchhiked a ride from him out in the desert when the Ethiopian eunuch was returning from Jerusalem back to his own country. And he was reading the 53rd chapter of Isaiah as he was sitting in his chariot. And the little picture I was given as a boy in Sunday school, it showed this Ethiopian eunuch holding the lines with one hand, uh, horses hitched to the chariot, and he's reading a book with the other hand. Well, I want to tell you that's not the way it happened. This man was an official of the government of Ethiopia, and he was going across that desert in style. I'm sure that he was under some sort of a shade and sitting there reading, and he had a chauffeur who was doing the driving for him. The thing is, this idea of him holding on to the reins and reading, that might apply to a Los Angeles driver, but not to the Ethiopian eunuch of that day. Well, this was the question that he asked of Philip. He says, who is the prophet talking about? Is he speaking of himself or some other one? And now I read the quotation from the book of Acts. We are told, then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ in John, the 12th chapter, verse 38, he quoted from Isaiah 53, and he made application to himself. And Paul in Romans 10, 16, quotes from this same chapter in connection with the gospel of Christ. Now, without attempting at all to enlarge upon these references, we want to affirm that Isaiah 53 refers to Christ. And even more than that, it is a photograph of the cross of Christ as he was dying there. Now, this chapter, as we've indicated before, tells us two things about the Lord Jesus Christ. We have in the first nine verses the suffering of Christ, are the suffering of the Savior. And in verses 10 through 12, we have the satisfaction of the Savior. Now, you will find that these two belong together, suffering and satisfaction. Suffering always precedes satisfaction. Too many folk today are trying to take a shortcut to happiness by attempting to avoid all the trying experiences of life. And I'm here to tell you today, there's no short route to satisfaction. And that's the reason that I condemn with no unmistakable terms the fact that a great many people think if you go take a little course of a week or of a few weeks, go once a week for several months, 
that somehow or another it gives you the answer to all the problems of life and that you are well equipped then armed with the armor of God. Well, may I say to you, that's not the way God does it. And there's no short route. Even God did not go the short route. He could have avoided the cross and accepted the crown. That was Satan's suggestion, you remember. But suffering comes before satisfaction always. And the phraseology bears various expressions. For instance, like this, through trial to triumph. Sunshine comes after the clouds. Light follows darkness, and flowers come after the rain clouds. Now, that seems to be God's way of doing things. And since it's His method, then it's the very best way. Perhaps today you are sitting in the shadows of life. Trials confront you. Problems overwhelm you. The fiery furnace is your present lot, and you've tasted the bitter without the sweet. And if that's your case right now, then let me encourage your heart and fortify your faith for saying that you're on the same pathway that God followed and that it leads at last to light if you walk with him. For weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Now with that in mind, let's look at the suffering of the Savior. This chapter here opens with the very enigmatic inquiry. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the bared arm of the Lord revealed? Well, the prophet actually seems to be registering a complaint here because his message is not believed. This which was revealed to him is not received by man. And that's always, I think, the sad office of the prophet. And when God called this man Isaiah back in the sixth chapter, he told him, that you're going to give a message that they won't hear and they won't listen to you. And certainly that was his experience, especially when he talked here about a suffering Savior. And his message is rejected always until it's too late. God's messengers have not been welcomed with open arms by the world. The prophets have been stoned and the message unheeded. And that's true today. I think it's true right now to tell the truth. You remember after the last world war, when everyone was talking peace and safety, it was very unpopular even to suggest that there might be another war. Public opinion then demanded we sink all of our battleships and disarm ourselves for our leaders told us that the world was safe for democracy. Now, I'm speaking about after World War I, you'll recall. And there were a few prophets of God in that period standing in the pulpits of the land. And they were not pacifists, but they did not care for war either. They declared in unmistakable terms that God's Word said there would be wars and rumors of wars so long as there was sin, unrighteousness, and evil in the world. They stated that war was not a skin disease, but a heart trouble. And they were proven right when we entered World War II, by the way. When others declared that Christ was a pacifist, they called attention to the fact that he had said that a strong man arm keepeth his palace. I can recall as a boy that the church I attended had such a minister, and he was a faithful servant of Christ, and he sought to please God rather than man. But his message was largely rejected. He was not popular with the crowd, and the liberal preacher of the town was accepted. Time has now proven that he was right, and current events demonstrate that he was a friend of this nation and not an enemy. He was a prophet of God and could say with Isaiah, who has believed our report? And today... We are overwhelmed by the marvelous response we've had to the radio. But every now and then, friends, we're reminded that we're in a Christ-rejecting world. We've had several radio stations over a period now of several years. They put us off the air. You know why? They don't like our message. 
And one manager called in, and he didn't want religion, the kind I was given. He wanted to know if it wasn't possible to give something that was a little more cheerful, you know, that men were on the up and up, and it's onward and upward forever, and that things were not as bad as I seemed to think they were, that man was a sinner and that type of thing. Well, those incidents and experiences that come to us, they just remind us that we're in a Christ-rejected world, and we accept it as such and keep going and rejoice today that we have as large an outlet as we do. And I believe that there are right now in this nation of ours many prophetic voices that are trying to call this nation back to God before it's too late. And in spite of that, though, the crowd is rushing headlong after another delusion, and they are following any Pied Piper of liberalism that comes along and toots a tune that they can jig by, and they feel like everything's going to be all right. Well, Paul said the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, and from ideas publicly expressed, we're given to know that there are many to whom the preaching of the cross is foolishness. Well, I'll admit there's a lot of foolish preaching, and I offer no apology for it. But God said that they would identify the preaching of the cross with foolishness, and therefore this message is a challenge to those folk, for there is a reason for them thinking as they do. God says, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, for they're spiritually discerned. And would that they would give God a chance to talk with him. But it must be remembered that God does not use man's methods and ways to accomplish things. God chooses the weak things of the world to confound the mighty and the foolish things to confound the wise and if we were to call in a specialist in a time of illness, we certainly would not expect him to use the same home remedies normally used by us. His procedure might appear foolish to us, but we would follow it faithfully. Then should we not accord to God the same dealing of fairness as we do to the specialist? But we still have to say with Isaiah, who has believed our report? And to whom is the bad arm of the Lord revealed? Now, there's a very definite reason, therefore, why men do not believe in God's gospel. Men like to think of God as sitting somewhere in heaven upon some lofty throne. The ancients spoke of the gods whose dwelling was not with mankind. The Greeks placed their deities upon Mount Olympus, and the Romans had Jupiter hurling thunderbolts from the battlements of the clouds. It's foreign to the field of religion that God has come down to this earth among men that he suffered upon the shameful cross. That's too much to comprehend. The modern mind calls that defeatism. They do not care for it. A suffering deity is contrary to man's thinking. And there is a peculiar fascination, though, about this 53rd chapter of Isaiah. There we see one suffering as no one else ever suffered. There we behold one in pain as a woman in travail. We're strangely drawn to him in his cross. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. Suffering has a singular attraction. Pain draws us all together. When you and I see some poor creature groaning in misery and covered with blood, our hearts instinctively go out in sympathy to the unfortunate victim. Somehow we want to help. That's the reason that the Red Cross makes such an appeal to the hearts of man. Our sympathies are made keen toward those who are war's victims, the victims of 20th century civilized barbarism. Pain places all of us on the same plane. It's a common bond uniting all the frail children of suffering humanity. And therefore... Look with me upon the strange sufferings of the Son of God. Let him draw our cold hearts into the warmth of his sacrifice and the radiance of his love. Isaiah enlarges upon his first question by asking, To whom is the bad arm of the Lord revealed? 
And that means God's rolled up his sleeve here. And that's symbolic of a tremendous undertaking. You see, when God created the heavens and the earth, it is suggested that it's merely his finger work. For instance, the psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. And that word handiwork is finger work. Dr. Talmadge used to say that God created the physical universe and didn't even half try. You see, when God created the heavens and the earth, it was without effort. He merely spoke them into existence. And when it says he rested on the seventh day, he wasn't tired. He just had finished everything. It was completed. It wasn't necessary for him to get up and do something that was undone. But when God redeemed man, it required his bared arm. For salvation was his greatest undertaking. You see, one of the objections offered to God's salvation is that it's free. Now, if you mean by that, that for man it's free, then that's correct. Man can pay nothing, nor does he have anything to offer for salvation. The reason that it's free for man is because it costs God everything. He had to bear his arm. He gave his son to die upon the cross. Redemption is an infinite task that only God could perform. Salvation is free, but it's surely not cheap. Now, we have brought before us the person of Christ. We're told something of his origin on the human side. Isaiah says here in verse 2 of the 53rd chapter, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Christ was a root out of a dry ground. Now, that means that at the time of the birth of Christ, the family of David had been cut off from the kingship. They were peasants. You see, we'd seen before the stem came out of Jesse. They were no longer princes. They were peasants. The nation Israel was under the iron heel of Rome. They were not free. The Roman Empire produced no great civilization. They merely were good imitators of great civilizations. And there was mediocre achievement and pseudo-culture. The moral foundation was gone. A virile manhood and a virtuous womanhood were supplanted by a debauched and pleasure-loving citizenry. The religion of Israel had gone to seed. They merely performed an empty ritual, and the heart remained cold and indifferent. Into such a situation Christ came. He came from a noble family that was cut off from a nation that had become a vassal to Rome in a day and age that was decadent. The loveliest flower of humanity came from the driest spot and period of the world's history. It was humanly impossible for his day and generation to produce him, but he came nevertheless, for he came from God. May I use this ridiculous illustration? It would be, friend, like you and me walking out here in the desert in Arizona. And I don't say California because you can't tell, though, the difference when you leave California and go in Arizona, friends. It's desert, and you can't get it any drier than that desert is. Now, suppose you and I were walking across that desert and dry, not a green sprig anywhere. And all of a sudden, we came upon a great big head of iceberg lettuce growing right out of that dry, dusty soil. You and I, we'd be amazed. We'd say, how in the world can this head of lettuce grow out here? And it would be a miracle. Well, the coming of Christ was just like that. That day could never produce him. And that is the thing that evolution has always tried to get rid of is the Lord Jesus and who he is because humanity can't produce him, and yet he came into humanity. Evolution could never turn out a Jesus. If it did, why hadn't it turned out another one? The interesting thing is, he's different. Therefore, he's the root out of a dry ground. Now that prophet focuses our attention immediately upon his suffering and death upon the cross. He hath no form or majesty, and when we shall see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. That is in the second verse of the 53rd chapter also. 
And now some have drawn the inference from this statement that Christ was unattractive and misshapen in some way. Some even dare to suggest that he was repulsive in his personal appearance. That cannot be true because he was the perfect man and the Gospels do not countenance nor even lend support to any such viewpoint. It was on the cross that this declaration of him became true in a very real way. His suffering was so intense that he became drawn and misshapen. That cross was not a very pretty thing. It was absolutely repulsive to view many fashion crosses today that look very attractive. But they do not represent his cross. His cross was not good to look upon. His suffering was unspeakable. His death was horrible. He endured what no man endured. He did not even look human after the ordeal of the cross, as we suggested last time. He was a mass of unsightly flesh. Now, naturally, we're eager to learn why his death was different and horrible. What is the meaning of the depths of his suffering? Now note very carefully the answer. He's smitten of God and afflicted. The prophet was so afraid that you and I had missed that, that he mentioned it three times in this passage. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. Consternation fills our souls when we recognize that it was God who treated the perfect man in such terrible fashion. Candidly, we do not understand it, and we're led to inquire why God should treat him in this manner. What had he done to merit such treatment? Look for a moment again at that cross. Christ was on the cross six hours, hanging between heaven and earth from nine o'clock in the morning until three in the afternoon. In the first three hours, man did his worst. He ridiculed and insult upon him, spat upon him, nailed him without mercy to the cruel cross, and then sat down to watch him die. At 12 o'clock noon, after he'd hung there for three hours in agony, God drew a veil over the sun and darkness covered that scene, shutting out from human eye the transaction between the Father and the Son. For Christ became the sacrifice for the sin of the world. God made his soul an offering for sin. He was treated as sin, for we are told that he was made sin for us who knew no sin. If you want to know if God hates sin, look at the cross. If you want to know if God will punish sin, look at the darling of his heart enduring the tortures of its penalty. By what vain conceit can you and I hope to escape if we neglect so great a salvation? That cross became an altar where we behold the Lamb of God taking away the sin of the world. He was dying for somebody else. He was dying for you and me. Listen to the prophet here. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's the fifth and sixth verses of this 53rd chapter. My friend, he was merely taking your place and mine. He had done nothing amiss. He was wholly harmless and undefiled and separate from sinners. He was a substitute that the love of God provided for you and me so that he might save us. And can you think of a worse sin than to reject the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? Now, I'll have to leave off right there today, but I'm going to finish this, this wonderful chapter next time, and then we'll move right on through Isaiah. And until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. I'll see you next time as our study of Isaiah 53 continues right here on Through the Bible. In the meantime, if you've got any questions about this ministry or you want to know more about God's wonderful offer of salvation that we heard about today, call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE or visit ttb.org and search for How Can I Know God? Or you can always write to Box 7100. 
Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. I'm Steve Schwetz, grateful for your company on the Bible bus as we study God's whole word together. Well, ride the Bible bus for five years and you'll be amazed at what God teaches you from His Word about what it means to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It's a blessing that keeps on going. That's what we believe at Through the Bible.